my, um, my guest doesn't need any introduction. It's Michael Spence. He's a Nobel Prize, Nobel Laureate in Economics. And uh, that's where we're going to let it go. Um, we'll start right with the conversation. He and I are kind of colleagues, not as no Nobel laureates, but we hang out occasionally at the same American campus, which is Stanford. But we never met, and so it took us about 6,000 miles to finally <laughs> meet. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, Michael, the, this organization has uh, scripted our conversation t very tightly, mm -hmm. and I will at, will at least obey the first rule. And the first <laughs> rule is to ask you, what keeps you up at night? This so is not my question, it's their question. I understand. <laughs> so the frivolous answer is my wife. And, my and, <laughs> and it's not what you think. <laughs> <laughs> my wife's a journalist. And what does she do? She's a journalist and she works until all hours at night. We tend to eat at uh, 11.30 uh, in the evening. Uh, well, it keeps me up at night and what I was hoping we could talk around today is the <laughs> is the fact that I think we're in a, in a pattern in which the intergenerational opportunity set is actually declining, at least in the uh, industrialized countries. Can I translate that? That means the kid is not going to be better off than the old man? Yeah, there are surveys in America, lots of them, that suggest that people think their children and their grandchildren are going to have a reduced set of opportunities with respect to employment and, and that's rewarding and so on. And that keeps me up at night, Joe. Uh, let's first start with what the reason might be for this. Well, that's complicated. I mean, uh, you know, well, this is called a breakthrough session. You've got session. half an hour. You've got half an hour. I know. <laughs> the, this is, I don't know what a breakthrough is, but, <laughs> but le let me try to answer that by saying I spent the better part of the last seven or eight years working with and in developing countries on difficult issues related to growth, growth strategy, policies that support it. And I think there's a, a number of lessons that came out of that. Um, but, the main, but the main thing, the thing I wrote about in my book, is that the developing countries are becoming large, further up the value-added chains, mm -hmm. and are having a, a growing impact on each other, on the global economy, and on the advanced countries. But how does this reduce mobility in the U.S. or in the West in general? It doesn't reduce mobility, but it has, but it has uh, impacts on the structure. So let me, let me jump ahead. So then I decided that a lot of us, including me, were doing some hand-waving about structural s changes in the advanced countries. And I went and looked at the American economy over 18 years coming into the crisis to try to figure out where we generated employment mm -hmm. and where we generated growth, value, and so on. And the, and the answer that, that we found by doing this you know, industry by industry, paying attention to what's tradable and what's not tradable in the in the global economy, the United States generated an astonishing number of jobs in that period, 20, more than 27 million, and 98% of them were in the non-tradable sector. And, and, and that's a pattern that I don't think can persist. Which, why is it, why is it worse to, to produce stuff that's produced and consumed at home? as opposed to stuff that you can sell abroad. So if you look carefully at, the, it, at, at this evolution, what happened is that the tradable sector actually created quite a lot of growth mm -hmm. uh, and quite a lot of value. Uh, tradable goods, are they generally higher value added? No, but the part of the value added, the global value added yeah. chain that resides in advanced countries is the higher value added part. All right, so these things move around pretty fast in yeah. the global economy. And, and, and so what happened is that the tradable sector was a growth engine but not an employment engine. And all of these people flowing into the job market flowed across the tradable, non-tradable boundary into the non-tradable side and found employment somewhat miraculously. Okay, uh, well, the tradable stuff, which is high value added, does not create employment. No, it doesn't. And ca is, the, uh, is the obverse true? Tradable, non-tradable stuff creates employment but doesn't add high value? No, but the, most of the incremental value added yeah. in the non-tradable side was used up by adding people. So if you look at the incomes in the non-tradable side, they're flat, mm -hmm. relatively flat. If you look at the incomes in the, in the tradable side, 
they're growing at about the same rate as the total value added created. Why? Because there's no incremental employment creation. G give us an example of how this works, what we just talked about. Take two goods which exemplify what you're talking about. Well, on the, on the, on the, on the, uh, and the, the, the best known one is the, is the value added chains in the technology sector because they've been studied so carefully. So if you look at the Apple products, you know, probably 70% of the value added is created in, in America by Apple with relatively small numbers of people designing products, you know, benefiting from the marketing and brand and so on. And most of the employment is created in... Uh, so, so it's iPod versus haircut. Well, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> That's what we mean? I mean, haircuts, by definition, cannot be traded. Not right now, no. No. <laughs> so, not for everybody. <laughs> so, well, some of us do go to Italy, for instance, to have our hair cut. Um, but that's a very small sector of the population. So, okay, here we are. <clears throat> here we are stuck with a pattern which is probably true for other Western countries, true, true but more so for the United States because it apparently has uh, offshored a lot of its manufacture to other countries. Is that's part of the problem. The, the really distinctive um, uh, you know, case that's different is Germany. Because uh, it still has industry. Because they went through a, a very serious set of reforms in the Correct. last 10 years under Chancellor Schroeder mm -hmm. that were designed to make the tradable sector of the economy remain an employment engine. Uh, so they went through a, set, a process, you know, interactively with labor, business, and government uh, to take away the labor market rigidities in return, make a commitment to employment, to fix the social safety nets so that they actually worked even without, you know, day-to-day -day employment security and so on. Why can't, why can't the great United States do that too? We can do it. I mean, in why, principle. Why isn't it being done? No, well, this is your territory, right, Joe? Uh, <laughs> in politics, are you talking politics? No? Yeah, no, so th this, I think, is the, the thing that keeps me up at night. And then we've come full circle. And I yeah. think that what I learned in the developing countries is that there's a short-run policy agenda, you know, having to do with cyclical things, business cycles, stable, and then there's a long-term one. Structural change, the growth engines in the economy, anticipating uh, where the employment's going to come from, you know, thinking about what kinds of investments in people and so on you need to make to do that. And, and my view is that the policy framework in a wide range of advanced countries is just way too narrow uh, and short-term focused. How do you broaden it? Well, I think first you have to convince people that actually you need a policy framework that has a, an extended time dimension okay. and that pays attention to, uh, in addition to sort of stability, uh, efficiency, innovation, and growth, which is, I think, what markets, we all agree markets are good at. We have to pay attention to a broader set of stability issues, certainly to equity and distributional issues and to sustainability. Okay, but, you know, if you ask uh, the, ch the chancellor who was here last night, mm -hmm. who uh, even is, is willing to concede that her low, low unemployment figures below 3 million, <coughs> down from five when she entered office were due to the Schroeder's reforms. Mm -hmm. But then she adds, you know, you also lost the election for, for doing that. He told me the same thing. Okay. <laughs> so, so that, I think, explains, explains the political sign. I think the other problem, the other difference between those two, two big Western economic powers is that the Germans haven't deindustrialized as rapidly as the United States. Correct. Has. So the United States has, what, what about 16% of GDP as manufacturer? In the in Germany, it's just below 30 or so. That's right. So, wouldn't your problem that you've you know, the tradable versus non-tradable, high value, low value, high income, in fact, low, uh, high employment, low, wouldn't that kind of would it, do you think it would be solved if the U.S. of A. reindustrialized? A large part of it would, yeah. And how would we do this? What about we always staring at this giant China? China is close to falling into the middle income trap where its competitive advantages are going down. Do you think we'll, we'll, we'll profit from that? Good, good paying jobs? No, I, I spend a lot, of time in, a lot of time in China trying to help them sort of with these evolutions. So I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic about the middle income transition. Now, mm -hmm. if you wanted to bet against that, 
then then you'd have the data on your side. Virtually all Every, countries. Yes. I looked at them. Yeah. Japan, Taiwan, South Korea. It's the growth curve goes up like this, double digit, then comes down to a normal level or declines below zero in Japan's case. Be careful. I mean, the growth rates come down as you point, approach advanced country status because advanced countries don't grow at seven to ten percent. Right. I mean, that's just the way it is. Right. Uh, right. We grow by innovation. Bob Solo right. taught us that many years right. ago. And and but but actually, the countries you named actually went through the middle income transition at high speed. They hit a you know they hit a roadblock in '97, '98 in the in the Asian currency crisis. But they went through. Most other countries actually just slow down or stop. So, so you could be skeptical, and many people are about China. But the answer to your question is no. You know, there's 85 million jobs coming out of China in the labor-intensive stuff in the next few years as they go through this transition. They'll they'll spill into the uh, the developing world at earlier stages, uh, and that then will be a different configuration out there in the developing world. But from an advanced country point of view, we may stop fussing about China and start fussing about Vietnam. And right. And a so number of other places. Somebody there at his extended workbench, where our jobs will go. It's China today. It's uh, Timbuktu tomorrow, right? Yeah, but the advanced countries aren't competing for the very labor-intensive, process-oriented manufacturing jobs, including Germany. Yeah. They're they're in advanced manufacturing sectors with technology and highly skilled workers, right. and and uh, and so I think that's the territory or part of the territory that we can think about in sort of restoring some of the competitiveness on the American side. How do we reindustrialize a country which, along with the other great Anglo-Saxon economy, the Brits, have come down so drastically to each about 16 percent um, of GDP being manufactured? How do, can you reverse that? I mean, you see anecdotal evidence in the United States, Louisville, Kentucky, all kinds of stuff where where reindustrialization is taking place on a kind of ad hoc, or is there a pattern there that you could see? Well, first of all, I think you, 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 most people think manufacturing is making things. Okay. All right. If you look at manufacturing supply chains, they're long, complicated, scattered over the global economy, and a good chunk of its services of one kind or another. You know, managing multinational enterprises, architecting these global supply chains, designing products. And in a good chunk of those, we're competitive. And so we're, we're talking about adding at the margin a little bit where it makes sense. And that I think you can do. Uh, you can do it with education that's effective. You can do it with skills, a focus on skills. You can do it in lots of ways. What's the United States not doing right here? Do, does it lack the kind of very intricate uh, vocational training system that the Germans and other Europeans have? Um, is, it, is the United States a country where you know, mass production in the 20th century <clears throat> didn't require much more than taking a guy off, off the countryside, <coughs> train him for a few days, and put them in, on, on, on the conveyor belt? What, 